capitalism uh, and creation dynamics. An uh, example of the law of three that's very important and illustrative is of the Vedic teachings of the three gunas or modes of nature ruled by Brahma, creator, Vishnu, the preserver, Shiva, the destroyer. There are also sattva, rajas, and tamas associated with intelligence, energy, and matter. If we look at modern science, they think there's only matter and energy. Again, it's dualistic. All things consist in three. And this, is, this principle is implicit in Blavatsky. In part, I recognized it more because in Gurdjieff's teaching, he says there are two fundamental cosmic laws, law of three and the law of seven. But the law of three is in Blavatsky. Christianity, you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, in Kabbalah, you have the three supernal sephira. All mystical teachings have embody, even the yin-yang symbol, are, the yin and yang are parts of the Tao, which includes them both, but is a third as well. The yin-yang is not really a symbol of duality, in my view. It's a symbol of triunity. The three, the seven, Blavatsky says everything in nature is sevenfold in the physical world and the metaphysical world. Now this is illustrated perfectly by the division of white light divided by a three-sided prism and it gives us a spectrum of seven colors. I would argue this is a model of intelligent design. Not only is the universe embody intelligent design, but it embodies particular principles of intelligent design. This is very important. I put seven and then I put eight. Why, why is the law of seven sometimes called the law of the octave? Well, that's because suppose we have God and God creates seven planes of being. But if you take the whole seven, they're completed in the eighth. Just like a musical scale, you go from a low do to a high do. So the law of seven sometimes appears in octave patterns where the pattern is eightfold, but they're related. And then 10, it's as if we take the three supernals and then the seven below, and it gives us a 10. Blavatsky wrote, number issued from no number. Next one. Um, first principle, fundamental dogma of occultism, the secret doctrine, is the universal unity or homogeneity. There is one indivisible and absolute omniscience and intelligence in the universe and this thrills throughout every atom and infinitesimal point of the whole finite cosmos. This is a, really an unbelievably remarkable claim and concept. That means if we take this little point out here that seems to us that nothing in this point, maybe a little bit of air, but Blavatsky saying the deity is in that point. The omniscience is within this point. So within this point that seems to be nothing there is the potential of all the intelligence of everything that's happening in the universe. Because the field of omniscience pervades everything. So all the intelligence of the universe is within every point. You'll see later how this relates to holographic theory. And remember the title of my book zero points within holographic space. You see, the holographic space, it, it, space is holographic because there's an absolute omniscience which thrills throughout every finite point. On the right, I, I quote Shirley MacLaine, who in the, again, because she g gave this a kind of popular, but, but good, she said, basic to new age subatomic discoveries is the concept that in the subatomic world, the stuff of the universe, everything, every last thing is linked. The universe is a gigantic multidimensional web of influences or information, light particles, energy patterns, and electromagnetic fields of reality. Everything it is, everything we are, everything we do is linked to everything else. There is no separateness. Very nice statement by Shirley MacLaine of this principle, fundamental dogma of the secret doctrine. In the beginning, just looking at some of the stanzas, 
the main point, uh, focus of the first two stanzas is, is this is pre-creation. And Blavatsky is depicting the root principles of existence during the nights of Brahma. And we see here time was not, universal mind was not, the seven ways to bliss were not, on the builders were not, they were yet, they rested in the bliss of non-being. There was no silence, no sound, the seven sons were not. So one of the points of the first two stanzas of Zen is that this concept of creation out of apparent nothingness. But she's also explaining in the first stanzas that there are latent principles. And in, early in the Secret Doctrine, she explains this triunity of forces. She represents, see here is an example of the Law of Three. The two main characters in Blavatsky's creation cosmology are the ceaseless breath and the eternal parent space. This represents the Divine Father, or spirit, this represents the divine mother. This is the seven-skinned eternal parent space. But both of these are apparent differentiations, and the third element is a pure beingness, which is beyond, it's unspeakable. Sometimes Blavatsky refers to deity as that, just unspeakable. But to bring that into down to so that we can conceive of it with our finite minds we have to contrast opposing principles now this concept of Blavatsky's concept of the eternal parent space as you will see this evening I, is equivalent to the modern concept of what is called hyperspace okay and Blavatsky's concept of the ceaseless breath is most comparable to, in modern physics, the concept that within the quantum vacuum, there is, it's never still. Blavatsky says there's nothing in life that is uh, uh, lacking in movement or activity. Everything is alive. Ceaseless activity. Ceaseless movement within the parent space. Oh, okay. Um, here's descriptions of both. This, on the left, we have her description of the eternal parent space. Now what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to explain basic principles of the cosmogenesis of the secret doctrine, and in a moment I'm going to come to modern physics and draw out the parallels more, uh, more deeply. But this is a very important quote. Space is neither a limitless void nor a conditioned fullness, but both being on the plane of absolute abstraction, the ever incognizable deity, which is void only to finite minds and on that of maavic perception, the plenum, or plenum, some people say, the absolute container of all that is. Now, this, con this description of space is perfectly corresponds to modern descriptions of the nature of what is called the quantum vacuum. For the past century, scientists dismissed the idea of there being an ether, and they regarded space as being empty. But in the new physics, they realized the more deeply you go into space, there's an infinite amount, huge amount of energy and potency latent within every point of the universe. We'll come to this in modern physics in a moment. And on the right side is the ceaseless breath, that, um, called in esoteric uh, language the great breath. Um, conveys an idea of movement and activity, breath. And in a human being, in Kabbalah, there are said to be five levels to the human soul. Each of these is connected to a level of the breath in the body. Your breath life is connected to your soul life. If I, you were hearing another lecture of mine, I work a lot with breathing. In the Bible it says God breathes into man a living soul. Our soul life is connected to the breath life. This is vitally important. Okay, and this is how the secret doctrine begins. 
an archaic manuscript is before the writer's eye. On the first page is an immaculate white disc with a dull black ground. On the following page, the same disc but with the central point. And this point 